Uh, open Sousa. <laughs> He's just like, I am the lone open Sousa guy. Bring it on, the rest of you. Ubuntu's, let's go fight. No. Um, no, I'm trying to think. Uh, all right, so we'll move on to, uh, since we still got just a couple minutes left. Um, so, desktops. XFC. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> KDE. Okay, so we got a couple KDEs. Uh, Gnome 3. Okay. Uh, Unity. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to think. LXD. <laughs> I like you all more now. Uh, Mate. Okay. Very cool. Okay. So the Ubuntu people are going to kick me in the face. Okay, good to know. Um, I'm just kidding. Ugh. All right, last question before I get this kicked off here in just a couple minutes, because we'll let give it a minute or two for the stragglers to come in. Um, like I said. Um, so show of hands for folks' day job. So we'll learn a little bit more about you, since you're all going to learn way too much about me today. Um, developers. Anybody? OK. OK. <laughs> I like this guy. They're going to, hey. That's my title. That was good. supposed to be doing it. You just wait. There's a slide on titles. You'll like it. Um, let's see. Uh, sysadmins. Oh, my people. Okay, good, good, good. Um, management. Yeah, okay, yeah, Mr. Yeah, okay, you're management. Okay, I understand more about you now. Okay. Um, I'm just kidding. Oh. All right. It's almost the top of the hour. I'll give him another minute or two, like I said. All right. And as far as Linux usage, this will be my last question, I think. Um, anybody who's been using Linux for more than eight years? Raise your hand. Keep your hands up. Anybody more than 12? 15? Does AIF count? What's that? I'll give you credit. I'll give you credit. Uh, all right, so we still got hands up for 15. Uh, 20. 25. Holy shit. We have some serious neckbeards here. This makes me happy. Okay. Good times. If I get anything wrong, please, the two of you, don't fight me. Um. All right. So we're just coming up on that. Like I said, I'll give it another minute or two. Young sir out there in the delightful red shirt, if anybody wants to come in afterwards, kick them in the face. I'm kidding. Let them in. Please let them in. I'm not important, so please let them in. This poor guy, he's like, he's like, Jesus Christ, this guy comes in, he's like, his laptop's jacked up, I gotta get him out of the laptop, HDMI is there, you know, what's going on, complaining about video not working. Yeah, he's over there, he's like, this guy sucks, he's like, can we get somebody else in here? He's like, he comes in, he's got a freaking black cloud walking over his head. Alright. I just hope this doesn't suspend on me, because as I said before, this is not my machine. So if it just goes out and dies, it's not my fault. Just so you know. All right. <sighs> Come on in. Find a seat. It's cool. Don't worry. We haven't started yet. All's well. We're hanging out. We're just learning more about the audience. It's all good. So, so since you came in last, I gotta ask now. Um, distro, you run. Uh, I'm butcher. Full list or just? What's that? Just, do you want the no, 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 no. Most recent. What you got? What you're kicking, rocking right now? Uh, uh, yes. Susa, Santos, Ubuntu. Okay. I understand. Okay, so you have a problem making up your mind like I do. I understand. <laughs> Completely understand. No, I don't. I don't make mine. Uh, somebody makes it for me. Oh, fair enough. Oh, so you're married? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that too. Yeah. It, life is much easier when people tell you what, what you should do. That's completely accurate. Just so everyone knows, today I'm gonna I'm gonna put my wife on the spot and torment her a little bit. Her name is Shannon. She's sitting right here taping me. Um, everybody say hi, Shannon. Hi, hi, Shannon. There you go. Okay. It's just like, now we're at an AA meeting. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah. So Shannon's here helping me out. Um, she was kind enough to put up with my crap to come out and let me come do this talk for you guys. 
Um, and since we apparently have audio only right now, um, hi guys, welcome in. You be recording your screen too. What's that? It's all lies. It's all lies. Well, uh, I, that was uh, my original plan until my machine apparently died in a fire over here. Um, but um, yeah, good times. No, Vilkeman, bienvenue. Come on in. It's all good. Just sit down. You're good. Um, but since we don't have a uh, video right now, fortunately she's going to help me out with this. So this will still be on the internet, and I'll make sure that uh, Linux Fest has all the information to point you guys to it if uh, you find something useful out of it or think a colleague might too. Um, so, so yeah, so mixed OS infrastructure, no money, no time, just black magic. So basically I have been working in the IT technology infrastructure space for probably approaching nine, 10 years. Um, so been doing a lot of very interesting things. So let me take a step back. Who am I? Uh, my name is Ray Shimko. Um, I'm a Tarth. Uh, I like long walks on the beach and boring the living hell out of my wife, Shannon. As we said before, Shannon's right here. Uh, on those walks, discussing infrastructure, Linux, and all things open source. So actually, by her allowing me to come here today, she doesn't have to listen to me prattle on tomorrow because I got to fly over 3,000 miles away to talk to all of you today about what I love to talk about. That eyes glaze over for her. So, moving on. So, most people then usually say, okay, well, what's your title? Come on in. Enjoy. It's all good. Oh, you're good. Um, so, what's my title? Uh, I usually joke and tell everybody I am the overlord of infrastructure. And they all look at me kind of like you're looking at me right now. Why in the sweet hell would you tell anyone that? Um, so like the slides are saying, titles are useless, um, especially in our field, in my opinion. Um, it doesn't tell me anything about you as a person or what you do on a daily basis. So if someone walks up to you and says, what's your title? I basically laugh at them and I'm like, how about I tell you what I actually do? Um, because it's basically stupid. Um, and if anybody managed to read the second bullet point, fantastic. But seriously, if someone came up to me and said they're a 10th degree black belt in server administration, I will in fact find at home back in Pittsburgh, I know it's far, far away from you guys, we have a nice delightful place called Woolly Market and I would find a gigantic wet trout and hit them in the face as hard as I could. Um, that would happen. Um, and just for anybody who loves D&D as much as I do, all saving throws are in fact nullified even if you roll natural 20. So. Moving right along. So the real question is, what do I actually do? Um, as the GIF shows you up here, um, I shove square pegs in round holes because that's what everybody I've ever worked for has wanted me to do. Um, that said, not where I work now, please don't fire me. Um, no, but everywhere I've worked has always asked for something that's wholly ridiculous. Okay, and we'll get into some of those things today. And I'm gonna pose a few questions to you guys um, this will be interactive. If you were hoping to fall asleep or sit in a carp coma, I'm really sorry. That's probably not going to happen in my talk. Um, so most of the time when people ask me to do something in infrastructure, um, whether it be build a server, whether it be um, set up a wireless network, set up a wired network, whatever it might be, um, generally they'll come to me and say, you have little to no budget. Uh, we need it like tomorrow, and it needs to do all of these delightful things, including pass these four security compliances. And you kind of look at them and you're like, <laughs> no, none of that's going to happen, but I'll come close, right? Um, so again, square peg, round hole. So before I delve too deep into things, um, if anybody actually read things, there is actually a really funny story about a Keurig. Um, this is the Keurig I have at home uh, with Shannon and I. So what you'll notice about this particular brand of Keurig is that it is a um, side water-filled Keurig. So you have to actually go to, over to the sink, fill it up, you know, put the water in. It's kind of annoying, right? But uh, let's face it, I can't rationalize getting a direct water line injected one. Okay, it's the house. So one of the places I previously worked, I won't say where, um, I had the CEO of the company come up to me after I'd been there for about six months, um, and he asked me to find out how much it would cost and what we could do to get a direct water line fed injected Keurig machine in our office and how quickly we could do it. That's not a joke. He was dead serious and he wanted to know in about an hour. Not even kidding. Okay. So when you work in infrastructure in the real world, 
you're going to deal with people who have no idea what in the hell you do for them. Okay, this is just generally how that works. Um, not everybody's like that, but generally the higher you go up the scale, the less and less they know about you, right? So I did what the CEO asked. I started looking, you know, furiously Googling, you know, uh, how much that would be and whatnot. So the office manager at the time uh, <clears throat> levitated across the office as she did um, and wanted to know why I was looking into these things. She's like, are you trying to take my job? No. I just want to keep my own. He's the CEO. He can just be like, you're fired. So, you know, just trying to keep him happy. So if anybody goes and has a Keurig, goes and gets coffee later, you can think about the very, very sad CEO who knew absolutely nothing about what I did in infrastructure. So, so I have some questions for you guys. Like I was mentioning before, um, these questions are all real-world situations I have been in. Um, and I'm going to pose a few questions to you guys because I want to get an idea of how you would tackle them using, obviously, Linux and open source based things, right? So we'll see how close you guys come with things I didn't, may or may not have had a choice to have to utilize. Fair enough? Okay, is there anybody who doesn't want me putting them on the spot, has like a heart condition, anything like that? Fantastic, no one's going to die. All right, so we're going to move on. Um, so first question, so how would you deploy antivirus to a company of, we'll call it 250, uh, staff using Windows, Linux, and OSX, I can't talk, without any of the machines being on a domain? So you are in a domainless environment. Active Directory is not a thing. LDAP is sort of kind of a thing. None of the workstations, none of the laptops, nothing is actually joined to the domain. What do you do? you really go to semantic first? I was really hoping it would be at least a few minutes. I'm kidding. Sorry. Install what? Domain. Case, What's that? All right. All right. Installing a domain. Who said installing a domain? What's that? I love you because that's the first thing I said. I'm like, what are you doing? You failed step one. You need a domain. Sorry. Continue. Sorry. Dell K server. Dell K server. Okay. Valid option. Valid option. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Panda endpoint. I'm sorry? Panda. Panda endpoint. Panda endpoint. Stay right there. I love that man. He's awesome. Your glasses, fantastic. Extremely sexy. I like it. So this guy said Panda. Okay, who else? Ansible. Ansible? Okay, so you're going to Ansibleize uh, all of the workstations <laughs> with a handful of scripts to deploy antivirus. So I'll give you partial credit because that part will work, but we'll come back to why that would be rough later. Um, anybody else? Any other takers? It's okay if you don't. Once, twice. What's that? Educate the, educate the users. What are you going to educate them to do? What are you going to educate them to do? You install antivirus. Okay. You still got to give them a solution. You can't just say, hey, you all need antivirus immediately. And be like, all right, which one? That one. Point to the internet. You know, like, you got to give them something, right? Okay. Anybody else before we move on to the actual answer? No? Any takers? Okay. All right. So we'll move on. So. Panda man over there, my hero, my spirit animal. Yeah, we, uh, we ended up actually implementing Panda's cloud-based antivirus. Um, the reason that we did that, um, I'm not gonna give too much away because there's a few other questions around that, um, but the long and the short of it was, going back to the gentleman in the back as far as educating your users, um, that's actually a valid point. Uh, there is a way for you to basically email all of the users and say, click this button, it shall do things, and it will install the antivirus for them because let's face it, you don't want to confuse your users, right? Click this button, it does stuff, you don't have to care, have a good day, right? It's literally what happens. So now if anybody's thinking real hard right now, they're saying, but Ray, how do you actually know they installed it? How are you gonna manage it? These are all very valid questions, right? Hold tight, it's coming, I promise, okay? But so far, that man over there, Cupid doll, I love you, if I had swag, you'd get it, yes sir? What's that? <laughs> so, so no, actually, no, no, wait a minute. I'm going to sidebar because that's actually a valid point. Okay. So here's the thing is that if my user base is, <clears throat> has so many technical problems that they're going to click on phishing emails, malware things, all that very stuff, if they can't suss that out or at an absolute minimum come to me and say, Ray, overlord of infrastructure, should I click this? I have much bigger problems, right? 
So I have already failed educating them as far as being an average or above average technical user on my network, right? But that's a valid point. Uh, where, where I am today, the actual stated uh, security policy around that is don't embed any links and emails. Even if it's something, say, like, for argument's sake, we'll, play, we'll just play around with things and say, um, I send you a Jira link and a ticket. That's fine, but you can't embed it. You have to, you have to actually write out or copy the entire link. You cannot embed it and say, like, the word, you know, happy text is going to kill your machine.exe. Okay. Um, they get very grumpy about that. Um, to me personally, I think that's a little crazy. I would rather just educate my users to basically be better users. Um, so no, that's an absolutely valid point. Very astute of you, young sir. Question two, how would you make sure that everyone in the company actually had the antivirus installed with no, with no domain? Yes, sir, in the corner. Um, find a way to infect it. Everyone <laughs> I like this guy. He's just like, I'm taking a black hat approach. I'm just going to mess everybody up and then let's just see who's good. Um, I'm sorry. Yes, sir, in a hat. Uh, VNC and an all nighter. VNC and an all nighter. Okay, so, so what's that? Uh, so we were saying before, uh, rough estimate was about 250, um, give or take. VNC, with or without encryption? It's all over the network. What's that? That's exposed to the internet. Fail. Anyways, um, no, I'm kidding. Um, but, uh, but in all seriousness, uh, VNC, if you had it uh, encrypted properly, would be a semi-viable option in a small network, assuming that you have well-educated users. So let me put a lot of ifs in front of that statement. But no, just point taken. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Does your Panda Cloud report to a console how many machines uh, have, have, have had uh, this service or this, this uh, product installed? So you can just look at your installed base. So you're missing some. So I'll tell you what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna put a pin in it, but in a minute, you're, you might be getting a Cupid doll. Um, so, so the short answer is, it's coming, and I'll tell you in a minute. Um, anybody else? Yes, sir? And map and Google Sheets. And map and Google. <laughs> really, you went Google Sheets? You could at least go on LibreOffice on me, really? Like, give me something. Um, no, but that's fine. What's that? Yeah, yeah we, we have to clarify all the things. What's that? Did you see Brian Lunduk's talk today? You know, there, excuse me, yesterday? Internet of Things, we're all going to die. What are you doing? I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, it's fine. Anybody else? No? Really? Uh, guys, I'm not scary, I promise. Yes, sir? Ansible. Ansible. And see, that's two for Ansible. C plus one Ansible. There you go. Um, Ansible, viable option. Um, but going back to the other gentleman's question, um, it's going to be a little bit tough to um, confirm things were done unless you actually have a real idempotent script that would actually come back and basically skip itself right when you rerun it. So, yeah, yeah, I'll give you that. Sounds good. All right. Anybody else? For the record, all the Ansible people, I don't hate you. I actually really like you. I use Ansible almost daily, just for the record. I'm just giving you a hard time. Um, okay, so nobody else? Once, twice? Yes, sir. <laughs> Mass email replier, you're fired. Okay, I now know where the iron fist sits in the room. It's right back there. That's awesome. Um, that is certainly an approach. I don't know how effective it is. It's a lot like a, you know, the management <coughs> technique of threatening you with your job. It usually doesn't come back and work that well. Usually people just quit or just don't do it. Um, okay, so uh, any more? We good? Okay. So going back to this uh, gentleman's astute observation. Pandas cloud-based antivirus has a single web-based dashboard to track this uh, from the client that gets installed. So basically, I had a website that I could go to, log in, um, two-factor off, do all kinds of exciting, uh, you know, things that I wanted to do, go in and immediately see, oh, okay, here's all the, you know, list of all the computer names. I can break it out based on Windows. I can break it out on Mac. I can break it out on Windows. So I even not only know that everybody installed it, I know what group you follow. So either I really like you, I like you less, or I'm asking why the hell you're using that operating system. I'll let you guys decide which is which. Um, so yeah, so absolutely. If I had another QP doll, sir, you would have it. So question three. So how can you ensure antivirus won't impact the IOPS of the machine? I like that guy immediately laughs. You, you must work with some of the highest touch developers and engineers in the universe. No. Um, just makes me smile. Sorry. Um, so thoughts, feelings? Ionize? 
What's that? Ionize? Mm, all right, all right. Uh, sorry, uh, for those of you who might not know what IOPS is, so input output operations on a machine. I'm sorry, I don't want to, to be fair, I'm, I'm getting a little bit more in steeped in jargon and everybody might not catch up, so that's my fault. Um, yes, sir? But antivirus is supposed to affect the uh, IOPS. Say that again, sorry? Antivirus is supposed to do exactly that, right? Because mm -hmm. if it saturates the IOPS, it can't get a virus. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, so, so let me translate to the rest of you. If you run Symantec, it will ruin your machine, so it won't matter. It's gonna run like garbage, so you'll never get a virus. Um, at least that's what I would take from. So yes, sir. I guess my, the reason I laughed is was mm -hmm. is there like a, a threshold of pain, or is it like somebody's going to notice if there's an effect at all? Um, so to your point, um, perception of the user and threshold of pain. Um, so it's extremely subjective. As much as I'd love to make it scientific, um, yeah, it's much more subjective, right? So every place you work at, this is going to be different, right? Um, because there are some folks that, you know, I mean, you could put semantic on there and they work in finance and they use Excel, the internet, and email, right? They're not going to notice, right? Unless it makes Excel cry and then the world's going to end. Um, you know, but if you have, you know, a extremely proficient developer architecture of an application and he notices that his machine is now, for lack of more technical terminology, farting, um, he's going to be really upset, right? Um, but I'm sorry. Uh, so yes, sir. Answer, to answer, I don't want to ask the question. You just got to know your pain point. So yes. You, you, you pick which you pick where food, where it's going to fail. Right? Mm -hmm. You might not care about finance, but you know the the dev, the dev, or certainly the CEO mm -hmm. who asks for courage doesn't need to have his computer farting. Right. Right. Ab absolutely. So hold on to that thought because that's actually pretty close to where we're going with this. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Panda. Panda. Okay. So, so, so you're hoping that Panda will tell you that it won't impact IOPS. They will. Um, <laughs> actually, hold on to that. We're going to come back to that, actually. They will tell you whatever you want. Was, yeah, it will tell you all the things. No, it's not a silver bullet, I promise. Anybody else? Yes, sir. When you deploy it, can you uh, specify that uh, it should, it should um, you know, uh, skip certain applications, particularly uh, IOPS-intensive, like database applications? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so, so question being, um, does it have an exclusion list? Can you pre-configure that? Yes. Okay. Yes, you can. Um, so that might, mm -hmm. might minimize the. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Anybody else? Schedules daily scans for night. Somebody used Symantec back there. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm just giving Symantec a hard time today. No, that's actually a very valid point. Uh, control when you're scanning, right? Um, so if you. Uh, do have a solution that's going to impact your IOPS, right? Okay, well, let's at least try and turn it on in a time frame that you know the machine is not going to be in use, right? Or in very light use, right? Um, anybody else? No? Once? Twice? Okay. So, so basically, this is what we ended up doing. So we ended up testing it on a small sample size of my most needy individuals um, who, in this particular situation, happen to be developers. Um, we had to make sure there was no perceptible impact whatsoever. Um, so basically, I took the R&D team, I took the architecture team, and I took the highest level devs that we had that did a lot of support for our clients and basically said, install this, run, go enjoy, make your machine cry. Tell me if you notice a difference. And they ran it for approximately a month, month and a half. And basically, after that time, they're like, we didn't even know that it was installed. They're like, honestly, had you not forced us to do the install, we wouldn't have known there was anything different. Um, so that was very, very important to them. Um, and you know, uh, I'll get into some of the other benefits as well in a minute. But um, yes, sir. Were you responding to an infection with this trial? Was I was I responding to an infection? Yeah. Like no. You get an infection, then you install it for a month. No, 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 no. Test user group and then no, this was so this wasn't a, a reactionary situation where we got um, hacked or owned or there was just something crazy going on from someone you know clicking on virus.exe. No, nothing like that. This was um, uh, me to from one standpoint riding in on the horse to bring you know uh, order to the lawless wild west town that it was. Okay. Um, so it was more we're trying to be proactive before we have that problem. 
um, in this situation. So, um, but one of the nice uh, perks about this is is that um, we were talking about exclusion lists a moment ago as far as what you can um, exclude or whatnot ahead of time. So you can do that from that web dashboard, but it also is built out of the box to be a client that actually does all of the heavy lifting in the background in the cloud actually for whoever was talking about the cloud earlier. Um, so it, that's part of the reason why it's, it's almost imperceptible as far as an IOPS hit, right? So it's almost a dumb client, which is kind of great. Um, so how would you handle, this is where it gets fun, how would you handle authentication if you had to support Windows, Linux, and OS X devices with no domain? Okay, now let me give you a couple caveats, nuances to this. So no domain, you have access to an LDAP server and everyone has an account already. Okay, so let me just give, paint you a little bit more of a picture. Um, it must support all three and it can't make everyone miserable. <laughs> okay, yes sir? What the hell is an OSX? Oh, sorry. <laughs> OSX is, uh, so an OSX is basically just a Mac device. So Apple laptop. Oh, this is a very ballsy gentleman in the back who actually lifted his <laughs> Apple laptop. You, sir, brass balls. I like you. What's that? Okay, it dual boots. Okay, we can still be friends. That's okay. That's, we're good. I was going to say, otherwise you're going to buy me a beer later because this is not cool. Um, yeah, so that's what I mean when I say OSX. So apologies. Let me clarify that. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so thoughts, feelings, emotions. Yes, sir? Could, uh, I mean, you could connect them all to the LDAP. Uh, I, know, I know for a fact Linux is you can connect to the LDAP. Mm -hmm. um, as far as OS X, I'm going to assume since it's a Linux base, mm -hmm. it's probably fairly simple as well, mm -hmm. uh, assuming that it's open mm -hmm. LDAP. Or, mm -hmm. I mean, anything with like 389 or mm -hmm. 386. Mm -hmm. uh, Windows. It's a lot of work. Yeah, it's not so bad, especially, especially now. Um, but. Uh, Windows, there's like Gina, which you can install that'll allow it to connect to um, third part, not domains, basically, mm -hmm. they're different uh, LDAP or even, I think it even supports like MySQL if you wanted to connect it to that. Okay. All right, so so I'll give you two thirds on that because we can we can we, we can come to an understanding on Linux and Mac, and then we'll say Windows is kind of we'll call it a crapshoot. Might work, might might not. Might be a little might be a little messy, right? Okay. Um, yes, sir. Okay, so so let me just make sure I have that solution. So we're talking um, LDAP secure, or, uh, certificate based authentication, um, and basically uh, go from there, more or less. And that should pretty much cover you around for the most part. Okay. 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 So basically, LDAP, Kerberos, security certs. Got it. Okay. All right, I'll buy that. Anybody else? No? Yes, sir. Using Samba to just build the domain. Okay. Okay, I'll buy that. It would take some work, but sure. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Puppet. Puppet. So Puppet is going to do all authentication across all three OSs itself. Well, I mean, you can create both of these two. Central administration if will I could, murder if I could, you. If I Okay, if you couldn't run it over. Okay, so so or I will say sort of so I will say that that is workable, but you are making yourself a mound of stuff to deal with. Um, but yeah, I mean technically that would work. Um, anybody else? No, I'm not scary. I promise. Okay, to be fair, this is kind of a rough question. So, all right, anybody else? Any takers? Yes, sir. Do radius. I'm not too familiar with it. I'm all through. Keep talking. Okay. I've heard radius. Okay. 
So, so, so whether whether you've only heard of Radius once or twice, ironically, you're actually one of the closest. So, hang on for one second. Anybody else? Now that I've given a hint. Is this authentication to what? Is this just for getting into the machine? Basically, this is centralized authentication. Um, so centralized authentication. So you don't have a domain, but you need some way to authenticate, right? Whether it be to a network, to something, so that there is a way to know the proper people are on your network, right? So just to clarify. Um, yes, sir? We'll go with cat cards. Cat cards? Yep. All right. You don't need a domain. You can have multiple domains. Mm -hmm. Your user has to be able to carry it, but you have <coughs> central identification against the LDAP, and then if, the, if you end up adding the domain or multiple domains later, it's going to still hold it, but like mm -hmm. the authentication is there. Okay. All right. All really good ideas, actually. Anybody else? No? Yes? Is there a panda drone, too? <laughs> <laughs> you circle C a lot on tests when you see a pattern, don't you? Because you know what? I did, too. That's OK. That's where he's going to work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. No, no, no. Um, anybody else before I move on? No? OK. So actually, what we did was 802.1x authentication. Um, it worked across all three OSs. So basically what we did was um, we had, um, and let me move on just real quick. Um, so I'm not going to tell you exactly what we did because it's going to come back to this question a little bit because this is kind of an extension of that. Okay. Um, but again, this young sir right here gave you a delightful uh, hint at where I'm going with this. Um, but the long and the short of it was 802.1x, you can do network-based authentication based off of the um, networking gear that we had at the time. It happened to be Juniper. Um, but there was a way to do just straight network authentication. So you basically didn't have to care if it was um, an Apple product, if it was uh, Linux. Um, with Windows, you had to tweak about 11 settings when I stopped counting. Um, but it was a more of a one-off thing. It was a set it, forget it, it works, hooray. Um, and there was a small enough populace of Windows users at the time, it wasn't that bad. So, um, but I'm gonna move directly into this because this is kind of an extension of that. So um, how would you enforce network logins uh, for Windows, Linux, and OS X users, Apple users, uh, with no domain? And I even prefix this with, yes, this is a hard question, I know. Um, and it's somewhat of the same question, but I'm getting a little bit more granular. Do you mean enforce login in order to access the network, or? No, I mean, so when I say enforce network logins, I mean a way for you to centrally administer like passwords, okay. things like, like password policy, stuff like that. So we've now identified a way to um, authenticate them, but now how are you going to centrally administrate that authentication to your users, right, across all the platforms? So that's uh, that to clarify. Anybody else? Thoughts? This question blows, and I made it that way intentionally. Yes, sir? Uh, what happens uh, with Windows when you authenticate against uh, radius? Does it cache it, the logins, or do they go walk the network and then they can't log in? Or so, so, so with radius, um, think of radius, <laughs> without giving it away, um, think of Radius as a traffic cop. Um, and Radius is, what Radius does really well um, is um, look at external sources um, of information um, and things like that. So, no, I mean, you take your laptop at home, right? How do you log in then? Uh, you, can, you can still cache things locally, right? So, so you can still have um, a local profile. So to take a step back, you still have a local profile on the machine, but you actually authenticate with 802.1x, like we were just talking about, when you connect to the network. So while you still have a local account and you can do local things, you get no network access whatsoever to anything until you authenticate, right? So um, in a sideways way, it's actually almost another you know, factor of authentication, right? Because if you crack the local, you still don't know what their network-based password is yet. Mm -hmm. So you get very limited access. So it's just another layer. Um, anybody else? Yes, sir. So you just configure the ports to require authentication to web traffic? 
Uh, so keep talking. Um, I I that that is part of what I did. Okay. So using radius and authenticating against the already existing LDAP. Um, so they keep going. Yeah, if I had a beer, I'd have to actually give it to you right now because that's exactly what I did. So I'm not going to put anybody else through any more misery because, again, that question sucks. And I made it so on, quite on purpose. Um, so, yeah, we used 802.1x at the switch. They happen to be Juniper. Um, basically, from there, I configured the port to point to our open radius server that was stood up. Um, the open radius server, basically, as I said a moment ago, is more or less your traffic cop. It passes that authentication information. And um, it basically goes back to LDAP and says, hey, is this guy really Ray Shimko? Because I don't know. LDAP says, sure, yeah. Goes back to Radius, goes back, break down the whole layer, right? Back, everything's authenticated, you're ready to rock and roll. So it's a great way to do you know, a couple little handoffs and you now have basically centralized authentication across your network, across all the platforms. Yes, sir? Could it work if the, you had user switch at the, the end machine? Say that one more time, I'm sorry? Yeah. It, it, so it was, mm -hmm. it was good enough to say, oh, even though he, this other user hasn't logged out, I have to kill the connection because user B has jumped on that same machine. Basically. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, it is actually. Yeah. So it will. It it is intelligent enough to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Is that what you want to do on Linux server with sixteen users, right? Say that again. Is that what you want to do on on Linux machine with sixteen users? Well, so uh, so in, in this particular situation, we're talking about you know a user who happens to have a Linux laptop, desktop, whatever, right? We're not necessarily talking about doing server-based authentication for a whole bunch of people, right? We're talking about just um, you know a developer laptop, right? Somebody that it's going to be issued to person X, they're going to have it. If you know the developer sitting next to them was like, crap, you know what? Um, can I borrow your box for a minute? It would still work. They could still use their authentication on another machine because again, it's at that network level, right? So um, you could just you know slap on another local user account, have them log in, off you off they go, um, for the most part. So so if I if one user SSH to another user's laptop, it cuts the first user off, right? So um, in the setup that we had, they wouldn't be able to do that. Actually, because we had interview on security, so, so you couldn't just SSH. Around. So it's not multi-user anymore. No, it's still multi-user. Yeah, no, no, no. You can you can absolutely still use use it for multiple users. Absolutely, you can. Um, you would just either need a second user account, or you would have to log out of you know account one, right, um, on the network and log into account two. Um, so yeah, I mean, is there a portion of this that is? Hingent on the user being a user who actually knows what they're doing, a little bit, sure. Um, but you know, there are also ways to um, make this a lot easier. Um, say for um, we were talking about the finance team earlier. I was picking on finance team. Um, there are ways. So if they have to use Windows, there's also ways that you can set it up so that it automatically does that authentication for them. So they don't even have to see it. So they just log in at a local user account, off they go. They don't care. But that authentication is still happening, so right? Correct. Okay, so that, all right. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, no. That's it, the expendable part. Is I was just going to say, I'm glad you clarified that. No, you're absolutely right, yeah. So we were like, you know, hey, you know, if somebody runs off with that or does whatever, it's fine, they can't do anything with it, right, for the most part. Um, but yeah, that was that was the um, trade-off we made, if you will. And the follow-up on that is, did you have anyone, like, doing RoboWarrior or VPN or any stuff like that that you had to worry about? Like, or was pretty much everyone just in, you didn't have to worry about VPN access to the network? So uh, so we did have um, a VPN appliance from Juniper, mm -hmm. um, which handled all of that. So basically it dumped them into their own segregated um, VLAN initially to make the initial connection. And then once they were authenticated, it would dump them into the original VLAN as if they were sitting at their desk. So basically inner VLAN security would still be um, uh, in place. So yeah, yep, yep, yep. So now that I've gone through the terrible questions, we're almost done. Um, let's move on. Uh, so if you are having, we're completely switching gears by the way. 
if you were having intermittent connectivity issues to the internet, what tools might you use to track that down? To clarify, ideally open source tools, right? Linux type open source diagnostic tools. And go. <laughs> Anybody? Yes, sir. Wireshark. Wireshark? Absolutely. Okay. Wireshark is a viable option. Anybody else? MTR. MTR. Who said MTR? <gasps> I want to give you a hug. I love you. Okay. Anybody else? Nmap. Nmap? Okay. If you're looking for ports and things like that. Okay. Anybody else? Airmine NG. Okay. Trace route. Trace route. Okay. Anybody else? Standard ping. Standard ping. I'm so happy someone said ping. I was going to cry if nobody said ping. Sorry. You block it. Like, yeah. Package you yeah, absolutely. Or, you know, add a dash T at the end. Just let that baby run wild if you're not on a Linux box. Yep, absolutely. What else? Dig. Dig? I like you too, wherever you are. I'm sorry. Yes, I like you too. Um, Dig works. Anybody else? Okay. The network equivalent of that. Okay. 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 All valid options. I haven't heard an invalid option yet. Net stack. Okay. There you go. Net stack. That works. Yeah. yeah. Net stack will work. All right. Anybody else? We'll put this one out of its misery pretty quick. There's a thing in that runs MTR personally. I I I like you. You hang out. We're gonna be buddies. I'm just saying. Uh, so MTR is exactly what uh, we use. So in our case. Um, it showed us that uh, we were dropping a ton of packets at our ISP's edge router uh, in the office. So basically, they were less than a mile away from us. Um, so we basically threatened the life of their level three engineer. He got in his Civic and he basically did 100 to our office because we were threatening um, not his life, more his equipment. Um, so it was good. Um, that is pretty much. Um, <laughs> I will tell you that in the middle of this happening, I had about 35 developers envelop my desk around me, chanting hate <coughs> at the top of their lungs while the internet was down, whilst I was waiting for the Civic to come down the road because they thought I did. It wasn't me. Ironically, who was the guy I was talking to earlier? It really was the network. It wasn't me for once. Um, yeah, so it was it was great times. But yes, in the real world, apparently, developers will band together and revolt if you do a bad enough job and they think it's your fault. Just moral of that story. Um, so basically, real quick, because um, I wanted to touch on MTR just real quick. I am not going to read all of this at you because I am not a lunatic. Um, but basically, this is literally straight from the man page of what MTR is. And I cared enough about it to actually throw it up here for you guys because it's actually an insanely useful tool. I didn't know about it until we had this problem. Um, for the record, if anybody actually uses an Apple product and tries to install MTR, it sucks to get configured because um, at the time I had no choice. Um, but it is doable. So it's, it's a very useful tool. I highly recommend using it. There are some caveats to getting some false positives and stuff like that. But as a quick diagnostic tool to get a sense of what's going on, it's kind of like ping and trace route on crack. So. Mm -hmm something to put in your tool belt and at least learn a little bit more about, right? So I'll leave it up there for just another second or two because I know there's a ton of data, but really guys, you can literally <laughs> pseudo app get install MTR or apt, you know, get whatever, uh, MTR and just look at the man page. It's, it's actually really, really, really useful. So I'm showing my age because I said app get install now, but anyways. Um, so, and this is just uh, what it basically looks like. I just wanted to throw this up there um, because this is what it looks like. And basically, the ugly, hideous 100% loss is what you care about. Now, obviously, down here, this is clearly not on your network unless you hate yourself, as far as any schemes go. Um, but realistically, like, for a second, let's pretend this hunt is, say, up here, right? For argument's sake, it happens to be internal. Maybe it's a data center, whatever. That's your edge device. You want to cry and threaten whoever is providing you network, okay? Um, so, yeah. I'm sorry? Oh, I thought there was a question. I'm sorry. All right. Was there? I'm sorry. Nope. Someone's on the phone. What? Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because because like I was touching on uh, a minute ago, there there are um, times where this might throw you for a bit of a loop. Like for instance, you might have say like sixty percent packet loss here, but then zero here. Okay, well that device might actually just not have. Uh, it might not be returning ICMP, it might be rate limiting, like there are reasons, right? Um, but realistically, it's, fa it's usually fairly cut and dry if something's really, really broken. Um, let me put it to you that way. But point well taken, it's very important to go both ways, right? right? To, see where, to see where the actual drop is. Because the drop could be happening on the return. Yep. So That's right. 100% correct. So, so as he was saying, it, it could also be dropping on the return route. Also completely valid and extremely important to know, right? So, but like I said, I won't I won't dig too deep into MTR, but it's awesome. Learn it; it's really useful. Put it in your tool belt; it'll save your butt, save mine from thirty-five angry developers, actually. So, this is my favorite question. So, it's the middle of the workday. You're in the office, and all of a sudden, no users can connect to the wireless network, but users already connected are working without any problem. What would you do to figure out the issue? Okay, you had your hand up first, you're next. First I would look at the uh, DHCP scope and see, I would look at your <laughs> leases and see if you've exhausted IP addresses in your Fair DHCP enough. server. I feel like this has happened to you before. Yes sir, you're next, then you. Same thing, it to me before. I was gonna say, okay, two people I like already. Again, if I could throw you a beer, be a thing right now. Yes sir, then you. Did you post these answers on the top? What's that? I like you because you actually read. <laughs> And you actually went through and looked at it. Yeah, absolutely. See, but what I like is I now know the guy who actually read. Makes me happy. He's like, seriously, no, that's great. Um, it's actually a funny story about that is, is that I didn't realize they were actually going to post all of that. I thought that was just going to the internal uh, Linux Fest folks as far as, uh, you know, uh, basically sussing out what we would be discussing. And then apparently they saw fit to put that on the site. I was ecstatic. But anyways, um, so yeah, um, any other? Yes? I just make sure I check the length of time that it was holding leases. Was that time that it's holding leases? Yes, absolutely. Anybody else? Uh, yes, sir. You already had the uh, radius thing working, right? Was that radius no. thing? Radius thing's working flawlessly, including with wireless networking, yes. Well, then you could check your uh, LDAP too, right? Mm -hmm. Or the radio. Absolutely. You absolutely could do that. See what's going on. See if, see if I'm getting a bunch of uh, errors in my logs, but somebody just railing away at me, right? Absolutely. Yeah, definitely something to check. Yes, sir? Um, along those lines, what, was, what are we talking about for your wireless device in this case? Like, so, is your, is your DHCP controller separate? So, for, so DHCP was managed on a separate box. Um, and, and as far as... <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Was it on or did it turn off? No, no, no. D <laughs> Let me clarify. <laughs> DHCP was on, right. <laughs> and, and that much was working. Um, but um, as far as wireless goes, I'll touch on that. So the, the wireless access points that we had, um, you could configure them to point to that same open radio server we were talking about to handle that handoff. Okay. So what was nice about that was we, um, we could take the 802.1x out, so to speak, and just kind of deal with... Um, the radius to LDAP talk back end, which was really nice. So we actually could take a step away. So that was even more efficient than wired. Yes, sir? Troubleshooting, you can set a static IP address and see if it works. Yeah, absolutely I could. Um, abso absolutely. Um, anybody else? No? Yes? Yes, no? All right. So as we were talking about a moment ago, so we reviewed the wireless infrastructure and we saw no more or, uh, saw more clients were trying to connect than IP addresses were available in the Wi-Fi VLAN. Live in the middle of the day, I had to go and move and resize the VLAN from a slash 24 to a slash 20. And I was ready to have a heart attack in the middle of the day. And fortunately, no one was chanting hate at me at that point, but it was kind of horrible. Um, let me tell you, you never, ever want to do that ever in the middle of the day. Uh, certainly not if it's the first or second time you've done it. Um, but basically, we had a ton of... Um, mobile devices that we used for testing and various things like that. So while we maybe had 200 and I think it, the accurate number was probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 215 or 220 individuals, um, a slash 24 would have been sufficient. What folks didn't realize was when you start thinking about how many clients actually connect, not how many people, the average person in that office had three to four devices. So now all of a sudden that goes into a much bigger number, right? So we eventually ran out. 
Um, so it was no fun. But fortunately, everything did work out. Nobody threatened my life. Uh, yes, sir, and then you. You guys did have different VLANs for like mobile phones and stuff like that. It so would be a different network, right? A different subnet. Correct. So, so, so the way that we handled that was um, we had a segregated Wi-Fi VLAN, but we also had um, with the uh, access points we had in the wireless infrastructure, we were able to. Um, logically segregate out, say, like a guest network, a BYOD network, things like that, where we could lock down all of that good stuff. So it's still the same network? So you're What's that? using same primary and secondary VLANs? Correct. So basically, same physical network, yeah. logical segregation. Yeah. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Uh, yes, sir? Yeah, it was the same question. So they were just VLAN apart? They weren't actually separate uh, subnets with different uh, masks? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so basically, so we went from a slash 24 mask, so 253 addresses to a slash 20, right? So we were just expounding that. Um, and as far as the, um, the logical segregation of the VLAN, that was done at the access point level, as far as like the various networks. So you could lock it down to almost you know, basically nothing. Like you could literally not let anybody go to social networks or anything horrible or whatever, and basically they just get the internet and mail, right? Um, so that was how we actually decided to segregate it out. Um, but um, to give you a little bit more behind the scenes, so we also had um, a VLAN per department is the way that we broke it out. Um, and we also had inter-VLAN security. So what do I mean when I say that? Um, basically, you sitting at your desk could not SSH or remote to or do evil things to this other young gentleman up here um, because we didn't let you. Um, same thing with, um, we also had a separate VLAN for say like printers. Why? Because they suck to secure and they're usually insanely insecure. Um, so basically we just only allowed say like line printer daemon or something like that to talk to the printer, off you go, that's it, right? Because um, there's not, a, you know, with the absence of, say, like, a centralized print server, that's kind of the best you can do for the most part. Um, yes, sir? So all of these, the ACLs on the switch or, or firewalls? Um, so they were, it was actually a bit of both uh, because the way that the VLANs and things were set up were not the way they should have been set up. I had made the proposal to change them to the way it should have been set up, which should be on the firewall, so that the ACLs would work properly. Unfortunately, long before I came to the town and put on my shield and my spurs, they were put on the switches. So that severely limited my options as to what I could do. However, there were um, various filters and things like that that were somewhat nerfed ACLs that I could use on the switch um, to answer that question. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions on this? Yes? Was your VLANing Mac based or was it set up based off of your network authentication? Um, it was set up off of network authentication. I, I almost never did Mac because I didn't hate myself. Um, that said, um, uh, another little tidbit is so if there are, if any of you work for ever or currently work for any corporations that need to be, say, PCI version 3 compliant. Um, if you don't have some form of Mac authentication or at least a pool of these are the Macs that are allowed to talk to my network um, so that you know what should be connected, you fail. You fail hard if you don't have that, which is kind of crazy. Um, <laughs> I don't agree, but, but yeah. Yes, sir? If you had it connected to your network authentication, a user would be able to have multiple devices connected under one login, so like your phone and your laptop, for example. Yep. Yep, you could absolutely do that. So, so when we were talking about how we would handle that Mac bit, that you know, one of the one of the folks over here was like, "That's stupid." Eh, I sort of agree, um, depending on what you're really trying to do and accomplish. Um, the uh, the wireless infrastructure and a lot of the other things were set up so that you could turn on learning, so you could just set everything up to learn the Macs for say a month, two months, whatever. And basically, what we were going to do is. Um, let's learn the Macs for a month or two. Realistically, somebody's probably not going to have too big of an issue in that time frame. If somebody happens to get a new phone or something, we were going to send out an email to the corporation and basically say, if you're going to be adding any devices, if you run your phone over with your car or whatever, things like that, if you want to put it on the network, um, if you want it on the <coughs> internal network, right, if it's a laptop, whatever, um, you need to come to us. We need to take care of that before we can issue you another device. Um, so that's how we were going to handle that, to answer your question. So it's not... It's not that there's not a way to handle it. It's just <laughs> it's a huge pain in the butt. Let's be honest here. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, that's kind of the long and the short of it. 
Um, that said, do you guys have any questions for me? Since I've literally been playing Inquisitor for the last, I don't know how long now. Um, but what questions do you guys have? Yes. If you actually had the money for the Nexus stuff, would you actually go with that? Or would you stick with the network uh, setup you have now? Uh, if I had the money for nicer stuff, would I stick with what I had or would I get new stuff? <laughs> um, <laughs> I was just gonna say, I'm a geek and nerd at heart. I like the pretty shiny. Um, I want new, I want exciting. No, uh, in, in all seriousness, I would probably spend a few more dollars um, and spend a lot more time on the planning and architecture of it as opposed to just throwing in what's cheap and works. Um, cheap and works is usually a fast way to get yourself in trouble. Um, yes, sir. Oh, sorry. So you were saying the Panda had low IO effect, or effects on the IO? Yes. Uh, next to nothing, ironically. Um, so, so the way that they achieved that was um, there was um, basically a back end of you know data center filled with what they called cloud servers. You know, really just their stuff, right, in their data center that did all of the heavy lifting. So really, they were just kind of talking and streaming data at the time. But it wasn't like something like say Skype, where I join a Skype call and I just watch my bandwidth go through the roof because Skype sucks and it requires a lot of bandwidth to hold a video call, right? So fortunately, there was a lot of compression and things built in. So basically, that's a long way of saying they built a good application that offloaded all of that work off of my network, um, which was really nice. So there was, there was very, very minimal communication. Um, it, was, it was fantastic, actually. Um, uh, gentlemen, uh, I think he was behind you. I don't... Okay. It's not the panda... <coughs> Yes. You know, if people brought in new devices and you were doing that filtering or, or mm -hmm. prevention and they authenticated through the network, mm -hmm. how did you ensure that the panda was then reinstalled or installed? In the so, so at the network switch level and on the wireless access point level, um, there were um, administration tools and options. I had to basically disallow anybody connecting to the network if they didn't pass you know, X, Y, and Z requirements. Uh, one of those was Panda. Um, and one of those was also um, antivirus, period. So like even for our guest network, if you don't have some form of antivirus, <laughs> you know get internet. Um, that's kind of how we set that up. Um, but that was more or less how we handled that. Um, so yeah. Yes, sir? It seems like you went through a lot of pain uh, because... I'm glad you feel that way too. Of the, of the no um, domain yes. uh, criteria. Have you considered Samba boards? Oh yeah, I mean, I I wanted to make a domain out of anything. I wanted somebody to like pull something out of a dumpster to let me make it a domain. I would have taken anything. Um, uh, management at the time, they absolutely unequivocally would not let me put anything on a domain because they're like, oh no, your developers will revolt. Nobody will let them go on a workstation or have their workstation on a domain. Oh, and I'm like. So do you want an enterprise network? Because most people, generally, that's what they do. Um, there are lots of good reasons. Because um, it, it wasn't even like a, a Windows AD thing versus, say, like, you know, like you said, Samba 4, you know, insert five other options I could rattle off off the top of my head, right? Um, it was they just didn't want to do it and refused to give me any money to do it. And I'm like... Seriously, guys, I'll go buy, like, you know, a $300 box, and I'll just go do it. Like, I mean, I don't care. Like, yeah, it, I mean, it kind of got to that point. Um, but to answer your question, um, you know, would I have made a domain if I could? Absolutely. And going back to your question, would, it, would I have bought something new as far as, like, a solution equipment or something like that? Absolutely, especially for that. Um, what else? Yes, sir. What do you do for monitoring? Yeah, um, so I can tell you, so um, the story I was telling you today is not where I am today, fortunately, uh, for lots of reasons. Um, but what I can tell you is uh, where I am today, um, uh, relating back to this, um, uh, we actually, and we also had one there for uh, our client servers and things like that, uh, Nagios. Use Nagios for monitoring. Um, it was fantastic. Um, these days, I would probably encourage people to look at 
um, uh, both Nagios and uh, uh, Isinga too. I'm probably pronouncing that horribly wrong. Please don't murder me, Isinga people. Um, <laughs> that said, um, basically, Nagios has been around forever. It's awesome. Um, but, you know, the fork heard round the world many years ago, um, it split into what's now Isinga 2. So a lot of the original folks from Nagios went to Isinga 2 and basically said, hey, all these, like, you know, things that people have been griping about for, like, you know, 15 or 20 years, pfft, we're not going to backport it there. We're going to put it into this new thing. Um, so a lot of the fixes and a lot of optimizations have gone into Isinga 2 as opposed to Nagios. Not to say that they have not fixed many things in Nagios. Um, but specifically Nagios Core, because it's free. Um, and actually, in my opinion, it's actually much more robust than their uh, commercial XI product for a lot of different reasons. Um, but what else you got? Questions? Yes, sir? Do we have any uh, per-client bandwidth throttling set up? Did we have any per-client bandwidth throttling set up? Um, I know developers have taken off. Yeah, wait. Well, <laughs> You know what? I'm going to tell you a funny story just because you said that. Um, so the short answer, from the client side, not so much. Um, we kind of let them do what they needed to do um, since it was kind of a um, mobile commerce space. Um, so we generally tried to untap the cork as much as possible for them for obvious reasons. Um, so he made a joke about only the developers who pissed me off. So funny story. Um, for the record, it wasn't me. It was actually my boss at the time. However, again, everybody thought it was me, so everybody wanted to come kill me. Um, so I'm walking around the office the one day, and everybody's like, hey, hey, um, hey I can't get to Reddit. Um, and I'm like, what do you mean you can't get to Reddit? Like, yeah, man, we can't get to Reddit. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm like, show me. So I walk over to one of the devil. He's like, look, no Reddit. And I'm like, oh, well, that's bad. I'm like, can you get to, like, DuckDuckGo? Yep, you can get to that. All right, how about GitHub? Yep, okay. Shit. So I start walking around, and I'm just like, uh, to my known Reddit readers, which was 95% of the office, because they were all developers, um, and I started asking, I'm like, hey, what's going on? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we can't get to it. I don't know what the hell's going on. Maybe there's something going on with Reddit. These were the nice ones who didn't assume I did something evil. So... 15 minutes goes by, and everybody starts, like, lining up, like, at my desk, and they're like, hey, what the hell is going on? Blah, blah, blah. Once again, everybody's getting their pitchforks and torches to come light ray on fire. Um, so I'm like, hang on. All of you just give me five minutes. Let me make sure that something else didn't go wrong, right? So I'm looking at all of our stuff. I'm looking at everything, and I'm like, I don't see anything obvious and whatnot. And I'm like, I'm like, my boss never touches the firewall. Why is it updated now? Oh, shit. So I go over and I talk to my boss. I'm like, hey, boss, um, you know, a lot of people were pissed off. Did you guys, like, do something to Reddit when I was, like, you know, at the lunch? Like, what happened? They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, listen, there's this one guy, and he just was pissing me off. He's like, and he's always reading Reddit, and I couldn't believe this. And it was pissing me off, and I'm over killing myself and blah, blah, blah. And he's going on, and I'm like, why? What did you do? And I, and I went, and I looked, like, he was blocking CDNs, he was blocking, like, at, like the IP addresses, he was blocking any type of rerun, like, he went nuts. And it was, like, this huge elaborate config that just hate on one person, and I'm like, I'm like, Jesus Christ, what are you doing, man? And he's like, he's like, well, I'm leaving it that way. I'm like, no, you're not. And he's like, why? I'm like, they're over here with pitchforks, they're coming to kill me. I'm like, no. I'm like, I'm over here, you know, looking like I'm a doofus. I'm like, no, what are you talking about? We didn't do this, and here you are over here, like, on a crusade because one guy pissed you off. Um, yeah, it, well, he did. He did. He absolutely did. So, yeah, it was it was fun times. But going back to his original point, the only thing I ever did, I did one thing, and I did it for about an hour to make a point. There was one gentleman. He, um, he watched Netflix every day ritually on my network in front of my desk. And I'm like... So awesome. I'm like, okay. So... Was so, redirect? what's that? Did you just redirect Netflix? No, no, no. Okay. See, I, I, see, I didn't use the bazooka approach like boss man. No, 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 no. I went in and I found his devices on the wireless and wired network, rated just here, uh, rate limited just him to 4K. <laughs> it was great. He's just like, I don't know why it's not loading. Uh, I think Netflix is down today. Did it for an hour. Did it for that same hour when he came in for the entire week, right? And he's just like, oh, whatever. Never watch Netflix in my office ever again. <laughs> it was great. But he had no idea it was me. 
So, so anyway, so, so Berg, if you watch this on the internet, I'm actually really, really sorry. Please don't murder me. Um, I love you. I will buy you a beer. Okay. Yes, sir. What's wrong with him? Uh, my kids know exactly what's going on when, when things go slow. I, listen, I don't know. I mean, to be fair, he was running Debian at the time. I think he blamed it. I'm not going to lie. I know that's terrible, but I really think that's what he did. Um, if anybody's running Debian here, please don't murder me. Debian people, please do not come flame me. I'm sorry. Um, that just happened to be what the story was. Um, but yeah, but any other questions? Yes, sir. So, so fortunately, um, my developers didn't hate me that badly. Uh, so no, thank God. Um, if I had to, that would have been even another set of hoops that I was already diving through because I felt like I was just taking ballet with all of the hoops and flexible things I was trying to build um, at the time. So it was no fun. But, um, but any other questions? Uh, do, do you have local DNS at least? And, and Yes. Uh, yes, we originally had um, Bind 9, and then we switched to um, DJB DNS uh, because they wanted to manage it um, with a JSON object because it would um, show revision history. Um, because Bind 9 didn't have a great way of doing that. But if nobody's got anything else, I'll let you all go. Thanks, guys. <laughs>